The purpose of today's presentation is to look at the rise and fall of the ancient Egyptians. So far we've discussed how the Sumerians were able to rise and prosper in the Fertile Crescent area of Mesopotamia. But today we're going to look at how another civilization, probably one of the most studied ancient civilizations, rose in Africa. We're also going to look at how geography played an impact on the development of the society and eventually how this once great society collapsed. Later on in this unit, you guys are going to be looking at the culture of the ancient Egyptians, the mummification, the pyramids, the afterlife. But today our purpose is to give you some background information on these people so that when we look at the culture of them, it makes a little bit more sense. Our essential question today is how does where you live affect who you are? This should be a pretty familiar question so far because we've looked at it, we looked at all of our civilizations through this lens. But again, we're trying to look at how specifically geography affects how a civilization is able to develop. So this is something that we'd like you to think about as you're watching the video. The biggest geographic landform in this particular area is the largest river in the world, the Nile. The Nile stretches over 4,100 miles throughout Eastern Africa. And you see towards here at the top of the map that it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. So it actually flows from south to north, emptying into that sea up there. The Nile provides many things for the Egyptians, even still today. But back in the ancient times, it was incredibly important. Much like the rivers in Mesopotamia, the Nile floods yearly, creating very fertile farmland. The ancient Egyptians especially were able to grow plants and crops that they eventually could use not only for food, but also to trade with other civilizations to get materials that they needed. So that yearly flooding was a pretty big deal for the ancient Egyptians. The reason it became so fertile was because of the silt that the river left behind it. Fertilizes the soil, makes it very good for growing different plants. Besides using it for farmland, however, the Nile serves another purpose. It provides an incredibly smooth flow for transportation and trade. We mentioned that the Egyptians would trade their food and goods up and down the river, and they were able to do that because of a pretty lucky geographical idea. Like I mentioned before, the Nile flows from south to north. So if we're trying to go northbound on the river, so if we start down here and we start going north towards the delta, we can travel with the current. So you don't really need a whole lot. You just kind of sit in a boat and the current takes you where you need to go. However, if you want to go south, you're going against the current. Fortunately for the ancient Egyptians, the winds in this area blow south, which means that they're able to also travel from south to north using sailboats. So regardless of the direction of travel that you want to go in, the Nile can provide that for you, and that was huge for the ancient Egyptians. Plus, we have a really steady supply of water with the Nile River, and water is one of those things that can be used for a lot of different things, a lot of different purposes. Uh, first and foremost, for drinking. You can bathe in it, uh, use it for cleaning. Okay, so the ancient Egyptians had that supply of water they could use for that variety of purpose. So this Nile, like it says at the top of the screen here, truly was a gift to the ancient Egyptians. As far as the people in ancient Egypt, for thousands of years, actually, well, I shouldn't say thousands, for hundreds of years, the ancient Egyptians were actually divided into two separate kingdoms. And they were called the Lower Kingdom, or the Lower Egypt, and the Upper Kingdom, or Upper Egypt. Now you'll notice, and it's not a typo, that Lower Egypt is located on the north side of the, of the Nile River, and Upper Egypt is located on the south. And you might be saying, why in the world would they do that? Wouldn't it make sense to flip it around? Well, the reason they do that is because, again, the Nile is kind of the center of this particular civilization, so everything is based on that. And since the river flows from south to north, if you see that little purple arrow on your map here, since it flows south to north, down here is technically the top of the river, so the upper part of the river, so we call it Upper Egypt. And when the river flows this way, flows north, we start getting to the Lower Egypt. This is the lower part of the river. So even though geographically or on the map, it's a, it looks like Upper Egypt should be up here in the north and Lower Egypt should be down here in the south, they did it this way because that's the way the river flows. So it's just something to keep in mind. So these two kingdoms coexisted pretty separately until about 3200 BC when a person named King Narmer was able to unite these two kingdoms together. If you look at the top right of the screen here, <clears throat> you see the crowns of these different Egypts. Upper Egypt had this bowling pin looking crown. Lower Egypt had the one that looks kind of like a, um, a chair or something like that. 
But when the two kingdoms combined, they actually combined the two crowds. So you see the, on figure three here at the top, this particular ruler has both crowns on his head because we have one united in Egypt. In terms of its history, Egypt is split into three separate eras. We call them kingdoms. The old kingdom is the one that we're probably most familiar with because this is the one where we talk about the pyramids and the sphinx and early mummification. That stuff takes place during the old kingdom from about 2660 to 2100 BC. However, later on in its history, Egypt was uh, home to two other kingdoms, the middle kingdom and the new kingdom. These two kingdoms, as we're going to see in a second, came about because of different invasions that took place in this area. Um, but again, they went from about 2100 to 1800 in the Middle Kingdom, and then about 1800 to 1000 BC in the New Kingdom. Okay, probably one of the most familiar aspects of ancient Egypt, and one of the most important in terms of their politics and society, is the idea of the pharaoh. Okay, the, the term pharaoh was given to the kings of these Egyptian areas. But these people were more than just kings to those who lived in Egypt at the time. These people were considered to literally be gods. Okay? Sometimes you hear leaders talk about like they're godlike. These people were considered to be actual gods. So what that meant was they controlled everything. The god controlled everything. Government, army, religion. So he was in charge of pretty much every political and social aspect of Egyptian life. And many people believe that these pharaohs actually caused the sun to rise. Again, they were the gods, and the gods allowed the sun to rise. So people believe that if they listened to the pharaoh, they worshipped the pharaoh, that he would reward them by allowing the sun to rise and making things pleasant for them. This type of government is called a theocracy, and this is the term that you're going to have to know. A theocracy is based on religious authority. So... When we have a theocracy, it means that a religious leader is also in charge of the government and vice versa. So in this case, the pharaoh controls both. He's considered the leader of a theocratic government. These pharaohs, and this is probably something you're pretty familiar with already, these pharaohs built very elaborate tombs. Okay? And a lot of times, especially in the Old Kingdom, they were built in the form of pyramids. And you see the pyramids down here. These are the pyramids of Giza in Egypt. And all these thousands of years later, these pyramids are still around. And even though they're kind of eroded and worn out, you can still kind of see the majesty of what these things were. However, the way that these pyramids were built has caused a lot of historical debate. Because, for, well, for two reasons, really. <clears throat> Number one, it was built without the use of a wheel, and it was built in just over a decade, a lot of these pyramids. And people were trying to figure out, how could these ancient people build something this complex in that short amount of time without modern technology. And it's, it's given rise to a lot of different theories. So the one problem that people have is because these things were, so, were built so quickly and are so majestic. If you look closer at the, at the pyramid, you'll also notice that the blocks are perfectly cut. And again, people can't figure out how these ancient, how these ancient Egyptians were able to create such, something so perfect without using these modern tools. This has led a lot of people to believe that somehow Aliens were involved in the creation of these pyramids. <clears throat> there are theories that the UFOs um, landed in ancient times and actually helped these ancient people build these, mo these giant monuments. Um, obviously, there's not a whole lot of evidence to support that, but there are plenty of people who have made pretty significant claims as to this happening. And if you look in the description of the video after you're done, you can watch some of the claims that these people have and see what you think about it. Um, it's one of those things where... Uh, people have their own opinions and ideas, and it's something that uh, is kind of interesting to think about. <clears throat> this is the Sphinx. This is another one of the great architectural wonders of ancient Egypt. And you'll notice that it looks like a half cat or a half lion, half man. The body is the half cat. You have the face that's a half man. Um, and if you look, you notice that the nose of this particular statue is missing. And there's been kind of a controversy on what happened to it. People don't really know. Uh, some people believe that it was stolen. Someone went up there and chiseled the nose off of the Sphinx and took it. Other people think it might have been weathered away or shot off in a war. Because remember, there were wars that took place in the 1940s in World War II where they were fighting in Egypt. And so some people believe that a cannon or weapons might have taken this nose off. But either way, it's one of those, those great mysteries. Finally, we're going to look at today how Egypt fell. Again, we mentioned that the Old Kingdom 
was the one that we most are, are most familiar with, and they were pretty powerful. But in 2180 BC, the power of the pharaohs began to decline. And when the power of the pharaoh declined, people started to lose faith in the government, which allowed for invaders to come in. So there was a period of time between the old kingdom and the middle kingdom where we had foreign people, foreign countries, foreign groups ruling over what was once ancient Egypt. Eventually, though, the middle kingdom was able to take over again. But by 1640, they were taken over by a group of people called the Hyksos, which translates into rulers of the foreign lands. The Hyksos were people who used horses to fight, and they also used bronze tools. So these people actually introduced tools to the Egyptians. By 1570, we have a new kingdom that arises. They, they take over the Hyksos, and they create a new Egypt. And the new kingdom is actually the wealthiest kingdom in Egypt's history. Um, we have, for example, in this particular kingdom, this new kingdom, the first female pharaoh, her name is Hatshepsut. Okay, and it's kind of one of those things you gotta be careful saying. Um, but she becomes the first female pharaoh. You'll notice that she's dressed in this very similar fashion as the other pharaohs were, with this beard protector. Um, though she's clearly feminine. So there's a lot of tradition there, even though that, this, that she's a woman, uh, she still follows these same male expectations of what it's like to be a pharaoh. I mean, there she is, the first female pharaoh. Eventually, the new kingdom was taken over by the sea peoples and various other nearby civilizations. It kind of divided, and ancient Egypt, as we knew it, that very powerful empire, eventually crumbled.